Within my politically and culturally savvy coven of acquaintances, there has been a lot of talk about moments. Little micro-incidents that attract or repel, that contextualize space-time, atomistic bullshit. I counter that moments are initial, one of a dyad or a triad or more of connecting narrative. Many of us become too busy or too habitual in our respective grinds to notice when a compliment to the original moment makes itself known. We remember and internalize the shock or the jolt, and these become primary. How and why these moments matter, over time we never explore or reflect on. How this moment links to the tangential strands of our histories is not addressed. I'd like to do so now. Rose May is my aunt, the baby of her brothers and sisters, but by far the most dangerous. In Jamaica, they call her the Yellow Devil because of her skin color and her ferocity in a fight. And if you know anything about Yardies, you know that most people know your character or temperament more so than your name. My mom was the sick Nickel Pickney, Jr., one uncle was the man about his business because he sold ska and Rocksteady 45s from the back of his motorbike. His brother, Neil, was the cock swinger because he'd fuck a knot in the tree if the hole was big enough. <laughs> there were several other aunts and uncles who were collectively known as the choir because they all went to church together and that's all they did. Needless to say, me and the yellow devil were closer than the choir and Jesus. In effect, she was my mother. Me and my bio mom were never meant to be. I think that I reminded her too much of her failure with my dad, so we never connected. But Rose May and I connected through the fist. She was the Mickey Goldmill to my Rocky. We trained for project eventualities. When there were no ifs, faced with more than one opponent, make sure that your back was against a wall. Why punch when you can pick something up and smack him in the head? And never, ever leave the house without some kind of weapon. Rose May was an urban warfare specialist. She was the cue to my ghetto James Bond outing me with unconventional weapons for a conventional battle theater. And it was not like she said, here's a gun or here's a knife. She was elaborate with hers. The first weapon she gave me was a hockey sock filled with change with a zipper to seal the opening. <laughs> Ignorantly, I asked, auntie, why does it have a zipper? Why not just a knot? She looked at me like I was a formerly bright protege. A knot makes it short and you have to get closer to that motherfucker and hit him in the head with it. <laughs> also, with a zipper, after you're done, smash his teeth in, the sock is just like a wallet. One to the bus, zip it open, pay a fare, and get away scot-free. <laughs> Her other go-to weapon, bestowed upon me with great reverence, was a pocket full of felony. A mid-sized green water pistol filled with bleach in a sandwich bag. <sighs> this one is the last resort. If you miss with a sock, you can't kick his cock, can't find something to stab him with, take this and squirt him in the eye for food times. Be guaranteed he'll fuck with you no more. Her tutelage and makeshift arms saved my life a couple of times. About a week after the Clorox launcher, I was picking up groceries for Rosemary and a couple of dope fiends tried to rob me. I had noticed them following me for a couple of blocks, but I figured, like most fiends, they'd forget about me once I entered the store and there were more people around. Not these two. They were a different kind of desperate. As soon as I exited, one grabbed my arm and the other the sack of groceries. The whole scene was like those two velociraptors attacking the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. I was struggling, they were all over me, and all of us were making a sickening racket. The bag fell, mangoes and butter and sofrito and bread all over the place. Upon seeing this treasure, the fiends abruptly shifted their attention from me and onto the bounty rolling in the street. With crack-induced speed, they started shoving the groceries into their clothes. I reached into the pocket of my, boat, of my bootleg members only jacket and retrieved the sock stuffed with change. I started to wail on the fiends. They were tough, chugging off my first couple of blows. Then I hit one in the cheek, and the three of us started because of the loud crack. Dude's face was indented. His hand shot up to his newly deformed cheek and he started crying. His partner flinched as if he was about to rush me. I started spinning the sock over my head like Thor and his hammer and he changed his mind. <laughs> After cursing me out and making unenforceable threats, they slid up into the shadows of a nearby alley. I achieved what groceries that I could, and when I got to my aunt's house, I told her everything. With such a look of pride on her face, she hugged me. For better or worse, we were both very talented in violence. When people say that violence is not a family value, I laugh and ask them where they grew up. <laughs> Brooklyn in the late 70s, early 80s was not the place one wanted to be. We'd already lost a generation of our men to Vietnam and the angel dust and heroin they used to forget what they saw and did in the jungle. Then crack hit, and it was like an equal opportunity atom bomb exploded. Once, reliable people became night fiends, skittering from shadow to shadow. Your babysitter offering to blow you for $10. Your best friend would rob you. The strongest, most stand-up people were felled. Rose May tried to shield me from the meteor storm that was crack cocaine. Between her and the ska and punk music that so captured me, I became straight edge. Not the overly militant straight edge because I could never give up sex. 
put straight edge enough that I have never had a drink, a smoke, or a token, anything stronger than a ginger beer, and I'll be 39 hey. in September. This straight edge identity defined everything about me. I railed against the evils of drug and drink, how it was destroying our community. An arrogant town crier, never thinking that the pipe would touch my family's lips. The first day of ninth grade. I just returned the night before from visiting relatives in Jamaica for the summer. I hadn't seen or spoken to my aunt in a little over three months and was looking forward to stopping by her restaurant and watching her talk shit with her customers. Me and Joey Bautista were walking home from school and we saw his older brother, Kike. He looked more smoked out than usual. Fingertips blackened and cracked, teeth yellow and rotted, clothes held together by dirt and bodily secretions. Let's go, Joey said. I saw the tears in his eyes, so I knew that he was really going through it. If he was crying in public, that's something he didn't do in our neighborhood. Jojo, Kike called. You got any lunch left, man? Pop up $5, Poppy, you got that? Joey dropped his book bag, yelled, and then ran for his brother, looking to do damage. Crackheads are damn fast. Uh -huh. Kike ran into a house. Joey followed him, and I followed Joey. The house was just like you see in the movies. Zombies everywhere. Little flames popping up at random, the cherry red glow of pipes dotting the darkness. We lost Kike in the gloom and smoke. Joey was still amped, was about to start a war with the entire house, but I talked him out of it. Just as we were about to leave, someone called my name. Who the fuck would know me in here? It wasn't a voice I recognized. I heard my name a second time. There, squatting to the left of the doorway, was Rose May. I heard her inhale, saw the tip of her pipe glow red hot, and saw the billowing cloud of poison issue from her mouth. What are you doing here, she asked me. She then started to freak. Get out, get out, get out! I never ran so fast in my life. Joey tried to keep up, but he couldn't, which was fine because it was my turn to cry. That moment, that 30 seconds of my aunt hitting the pipe changed my life. But worse, I did not speak to my aunt for over two years. The strongest, bravest, most honorable and moral person that I knew ceased to exist. She just evaporated, expelled from my life for making a choice that I never bothered to question. Why was never a factor in my conceptualization. No one in our family questioned why we weren't close anymore, nor did they question or seem overly concerned that one of their own had joined the ranks of the undead. Not talking to her, not being hugged by her was pain. Not painful, but pain in the platonic sense, a perfect pain, the archetype of pain. When I did speak to her again, it was by accident. In my junior year of high school, I had to volunteer at a rehab center. Knowing my hatred for drug users, Ms. McAlpine figured that this assignment would be a great fit. She was always trying to instill her overtly Christian values into every inch of our education. You have to forgive sometime, was her mantra. Yeah, right. As I was in the mess hall washing dishes, I heard the most beautiful combination of curse words all strung together with a full throat of patois. I turned and saw Rosemary setting up for the evening activity. She looked good. She looked great. I wanted to reach out to her, but I, felt, I still felt betrayed. How could you, out of everyone that I knew, hit the pipe? My mom could die today and it would not be a big deal, but you, Rose, how could you? While these thoughts were banging about my skull, I felt familiar arms hug me and a familiar chest press against my cheek. I missed you, she whispered. I tried to speak, but could not. Being held by her was like having a limb reattached. I wanted to ask her why, but I did not. 20 plus years later, I still have not. She had a reason and it was hers. This isn't to, to say that, I, that the why of her descent doesn't nag at me. It does, every day. But I lost two years of my life not speaking to her and there's no reason to revisit the void. About 16 years ago, she and I were walking back from her house, to her house from her new restaurant that she opened in Minneapolis, Jimbo's, the first Jamaican restaurant in Minneapolis. When asked, she said that there was no way that she could get into any kind of trouble in Minneapolis because it was so fucking boring. <laughs> Plus, I went to undergraduate school there, so it must be a good place to live. A young brother stepped to us and was rather aggressive while trying to sell his dope. With little to no hesitation, Rosemary punched the shit out of him. He flew back and smashed into a light post. He was out. Something ran up and down my spine and then settled in my heart. A moment was concluded. From fighter to fiend and back to fighter, full circle. Never again, little goat, she whispered to me. Never again, my promise. She's been clean ever since. When I asked her permission to write and share this, she laughed and said that she had no problem with it and if people could get anything useful from her story, then I should tell it far and wide. But make sure, she said, make sure that the people them understand that the smaller you break up your life, the smaller you live your life. Fuck a moment, you live me life. We don't live in episodes, me not a soap opera, me an ass kicker. <laughs> Rose May is well into her 50s and just started taking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Thank you. <laughs>